Keep in touch with the Wolf Connection podcast on our Instagram handle at the Wolf Connection Pod or email us your questions, comments, and guest ideas to podcast at wolfconnection.org. Thank you for your support and howls to you all. Welcome to the Wolf Connection podcast. I'm your host, John Calvin. Today we have the individual that really has sparked our interest and also the amount of podcasts that we're doing on the Denali Wolf situation. He emailed us a few weeks ago and really got this ball rolling um, and gotten us in touch with a lot of great people, Nicole Schmidt. And we're also going to be bringing a filmmaker's perspective in a few weeks that you guys will be able to hear that's actually doing an independent film on the situation, which we're going to speak a little bit more about today. So he has been, he's the administrator of the Denali Wolves Facebook page. He's also a conservation, wildlife, and landscape photographer, but also transportation system and wilderness tour guide in Denali National Park for over three decades. Uh, This is Bill Watkins coming to us from Homer, Alaska. Bill, it's first of all, pleasure to meet you finally um, and to get you on here. How's everything going with you? Uh, Everything's going fine. And, you know, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, it's great. And again, that thank you for reaching out to the organization, reaching out to the sanctuary, myself, and starting this conversation, which is great that we get this sort of thing out to everybody who listens to this podcast. So just briefly before we get into Denali and, and the issues that we spoke about with Nicole, and we can get your perspective, where are you a native Alaskan? Did you grow up there? Did, was wildlife always in your in your bones? How did Bill Watkins story start and how did you end up where you are currently? Yeah. So I moved around a lot as a kid. So Florida, Georgia, and then uh, finally Utah and moved up from Utah uh, to Alaska. Um, Well, back in 1988, but 1987 is my first season in Denali. And then ever since I was a kid, I mean, from earliest on, I had an interest in animals and then Growing up, I literally had a whole variety of animals growing up. And one of your questions that you you had asked before in in preparation for this was, you know, was I always interested in wolves? Well, actually, the first thing I was interested in were grizzlies. And back in, this must have been 72 or 73, um, National Geographic did a special on the grizzlies of Yellowstone from John and Frank Craighead's study. And that was just incredibly inspirational and uh, it got me really interested in grizzlies. And then um, later on, actually, probably my first season in Denali, uh, one of my very first wolf sightings we had just come over Sable Pass. We were heading eastbound. I was on one of the transportation system buses. And there was a grizzly with two spring cubs uh, off on the south side of the road, you know, 100 yards or so away. And while there was a grizzly, there was a wolf utilizing the willows and stalking the cubs. And the female grizzly didn't know exactly where the wolf was, but was, knew that the wolf was, was nearby. And so she had her cubs come in on either side of her and as the wolf was using the willows, again, to, to hide itself from the bears, uh, eventually it, it came into view. The grizzly female charged it, a brief charge. The, the bear stopped. The wolf kind of nonchalantly moved off. And, you know, that was the end of the, end of the interaction. But it was like, oh, my God. You know, you can come to Nadali and see this kind of interaction between wolves and grizzlies. I'm all in on this. And then probably about a year later, uh, another National Geographic special came out. And this was on the wolves of Ellesmere Island that was detailing the study of Dr. David L. Meach and also with Jim Brainberg uh, photographing it. And Jim's work was just stunning. Uh, I mean, not only the special, but the book that he put out on the white walls of Ellesmere. And that, that was also just an incredible you know, a piece of inspiration for myself, you know, not only with what I'd seen in Denali, but also with Jim putting this out. And that's actually something that's always stayed with me. Uh, in fact, I, I still, I still, I went out and bought that book years ago back then. And, and, you know, I still think Jim's work is just amazing uh, in regards to the photography of wild wolves. So when just give everybody an insight too about 
being in the park for as long as you've been in the park as a as a guide and and to the transportation system because that has to be like you said the first couple of interactions you have are are fa- are fairly epic what is it like to take people through these experiences and just guide them through the park on a fairly regular basis what is that like for you to see those people have those types of interactions or any interaction for that matter or seeing something might not see on you know a daily 9 to 5 day in their lives yeah, so you know, probably the single most epic event was back in 2001. Uh, we had this was a it was a 12 day interaction between the East Fork family group of wolves and a, a yearling bull moose. And, and on day one, the moose had it, it had been injured. It was standing in the river, uh, the Teklanika River. And it eventually would go upstream, it crossed over the river and actually went into Igloo Forest. And at that point we thought, okay, we're never gonna see this moose again. Um, You know, it's gonna go down. The wolves would later in the day, they would do scent tracking of of of, the scent trail that the moose had left. And it went and they filed single file into Igloo Forest in the same location that the moose had gone into. So we knew this moose was gonna go down. We just didn't know when. Okay, fast forward about 10 days later. Okay, the moose comes back. Uh, it's now on uh, actually the, uh, the north side of the bridge, about 100 or so yards uh, away from the bridge itself. That right hand is now completely opened up. And that day I was driving camper bus for the transportation system. And on the west side of the Teklanika Bridge is a, is a greater pullout. So I pulled in there. Park Service didn't allow buses to stop on the bridge, and you couldn't view, pedestrians couldn't view it on the east east side of the bridge. You had to go up the ramp, or you had to view it on the west side of the bridge. Well, on this particular day, because this was such a unique interaction, uh, I threw the schedule out. We spent about forty five minutes there, which is like unheard of. I, I wouldn't be able to do that now, just because you know legally you can't work and not get paid for it. So, and that's what I did. And, you know, after we spent the 45 minutes there, and actually the hardest things of you were the ravens interacting with the moose as opposed to the wolves. Um, I did have visitors who said, you know, that that made their entire trip to Alaska. That, you know, spending that length of time with this unique interaction, which literally was once in a lifetime. In fact, I sent you one of the photos. And, yeah, that's not something that people even typically see on a Denali visit. Um, but this, I mean, it was very atypical. And uh, I remember the next day I went out there to photograph because I had a day off and spent 12 hours out there. And Dr. Gordon Haber was with me in the small group of photographers that were there. And I remember talking to Gordon. I asked Gordon, you know, had, you know, has Gordon ever seen anything like this? Because he's the one who knew parks wolves better than anyone. And he said, no, he had seen wolves and bears interact before, but he had never seen anything with this type of intensity uh, between the wolves and the bears, you know, as they were interacting that day. Um, And so this is something, you know, whether you see wolves, whether it's in an intense interaction like this, you know, they're interacting with bears. And we certainly have certainly seen things after this, although not nearly with that kind of intensity, or whether you're just seeing wolves trotting along the park road, or maybe they're on the tundra, or last year we had um, uh, a wolf, one of the three sightings I had last year, where it had killed a ground squirrel, um, it was resting on the tundra, and, and so we spent about 10 minutes there. And 10 minutes is an exceptionally long time for a wildlife viewing when you're on tour. Um, and, and again, that's not something that we would normally see, uh, especially now with how, how much wolf viewing has declined uh, in Denali. And so anytime, you know, wolves come into play or when we had a chance to see pups like with Grant Creek from 2004 to 2011, anytime we see pups, that is incredibly rare. People are going to get cranked up. They're going to get excited. Um, in fact, we had another family group in 2018, Riley Creek West, who had established rendezvous sites just west of the Toklat River 
And one of the pups was a little adventurer. It would go off on itself because there's only two adults in this family group. And anyway, so we're, the bus is stopped. The pup is trotting towards us. And this woman just screams out, you know, he's so cute. And I mean, it may sound kind of funny, but that's kind of one of the, it's just something that creates a tremendous amount of, uh, amount of excitement for visitors who are coming into the park. You know, whether it's adults that we see, whether it's yearlings, uh, or whether it's pups or, you know, whatever kind of interaction. So how, how do you distinguish between wolf viewership declining versus just general park visitation? Uh, park visitation prior to COVID um, was at over 600,000. Now, in 2020, it did nosedive, and it's been coming back since then, you, you know, stronger each each year. Now, the other thing that's happened since about 2021 is the Pretty Rocks landslide. So that's that's dramatically changed things as we're only able to go 43 miles in the park to the East Fork River. And that's impacted um, certainly our viewing of grizzlies. That's That's completely flipped. Whereas used to be, we'd see grizzlies almost daily. Uh, now I'm tending to get shut out more often, a lot more often than ever before, because we can't access the prime grizzly bear habitat, which is in the highway pass to, to grassy pass areas. We still see them, but not. It's not a daily thing anymore. Uh, it, it, you know, and then as far as wolf viewing goes, well, since 2012 when Grant Creek the Grand Creek breeding female was baited and killed just outside the park. And that created a tremendous amount of disruption within the family group and behavioral changes. Um, well, since that time, we've wolf viewing declined to 4% in 2013 and has ranged from 4 to 6% with 2017-18 being exceptions. I think it went up to 16 17% for those two years, primarily due to, Grand, to, to Riley Creek West in 2018. And then it nosedived 1% in 2019 and 2022. So wolf viewing, it, it's really been devastated, I would say. You know, so if someone asked me now, you know, Bill, what are our chances of seeing wolves? I'd say that they're, they're almost non-existent. Oh, I understand. So I, sorry, I was confused. I thought you were saying the amount of park visitors that come to view wolves has declined. But actually, you're saying the ability to view wolves has declined, which is a different thing. Okay, that makes total yeah. sense. Yeah, the right. ability to view wolves has declined dramatically. Wow. And crazy. And, and I would say that there's there's generally four different ways that we see wolves, and this gets progressively rarer. So one is strictly by chance, you know, we're cruising down the cruising down the park road and maybe there's a wolf off on the tundra, maybe there's it's on the road. There's there's no predictability in regards to that. Okay, the second way, and this does bring predictability into play, but it's rare, is when wolves make a kill near the park road and where it's visible. Because wolves are gorge feeders, you know, they'll feed, they'll then leave the kill for a number of hours, then they'll come back. It, you know they're going to come back. That's where the predictability comes into play. So if either your timing's right or you're willing to wait, sometimes for hours, you know, you're you're improving your chances for seeing them. And then the third way is if they establish rendezvous sites uh, near the park road. And the rarest is if they establish den sites near the park road. And that's what we had with Grant Creek from about 2004 to 2011. So the trap, so I know the trapping and killing of the, the alpha female sort of dismembered the pack in some way, but I mean, what happened to those wolves? Are they, did they leave the park? Does anybody know how many of them were collared or, or whatever? What's the, what's the data and what's happened to them? So yeah, park service typically uh, radio collars the breeding male and female or, or alpha male and female. And, you know, the, in, in Grant Creek, there were 15 wolves in that family group prior to the female being trapped and killed in the attendant feet primary attendant female being trapped and killed. Um, they, within a year, they went down to five to then three wolves. And the other wolves are not radio collared. So I'm under the, I guess you'd have to double check with park service, but I'm assuming that these wolves uh, dispersed uh, from the family group. And that's one of the things we've seen pretty consistently when the, 
these breeding males and females are killed, either one or the other or both, it creates massive disruption within the family group. Uh, so if they stick together, and you know those three wolves of Grant Creek stay together, but they move the den site, their territory shifted to the east and then to the north and then eventually west over the years. They hardly use the park road corridor, so visitor viewing of them nosedived as well. Uh, and even to this day, at least as of last year, Grant Creek was in existence, but we hardly ever saw them. And all of this, all of these changes occurred because of the deaths of the breeding male and female. And, and, and you know, it's being human caused that. Uh, in fact, Park Service last year, and this became a part of my tour, they released a study on how human caused mortality creates instability within wolf family groups. And so, uh, yeah, that was, yeah, that was put forth by Bridget Borg and, uh, Doug Smith. Yeah. All those guys. Yeah. All, yeah, the, all the park services. Yeah. In fact, you all interviewed Kira Cassidy and by the way, a big thank you to Kira for, for doing that study because she kind of picked up and expanded on Gordon's work. Um, and you know, Gordon back then it was common for Gordon's work to be ignored. Um, and so it was really pretty awesome for, for Kira to, to look at the family groups and the culture of wolves and to really look at Gordon's work and then expand on it. So, yeah, I'm greatly appreciative of, of her doing that. So a big thank you to Kira for doing that. Is this something that we'll just, you know, we, we talk about this, this thing, I guess this finger point or whatever, this, when you look at Denali, it's this part of the this strip of land that's in Denali. That's the one that's really in question here that we that we talked about with Nicole, um, where there is different regulations in terms of hunting and trapping and things like that. Has this always been a major source of hunting and trapping in there that has destabilized a lot of these wolf packs? Or is this more of a recent occurrence? Like you said, it seems that wolf viewing was fine. And then we hit this 20... 14, 15, whatever mark. And then all of a sudden we have a lot of dispersion of packs, sizes go down, viewing goes down. Has this, has trapping increased? What, what has been the, the major catalyst in that strip of land inside of, of Denali that has, you know, really shaken up the, the, you know, the wolf packs essentially, but also the ecosystems there. It, yeah. So, so the wolf townships has been recognized for decades. It's critical you know, critical wildlife habitat for both caribou and, and the park's wolves. And then, in fact, I think Gordon put forward the first proposed buffer zone in probably like the earlier mid-1970s. And then uh, I think it was 2001, the, the Board of Game uh, established a, a small buffer zone. Uh, it would eventually be uh, roughly about half the wolf townships. Uh, the other half was open to hunting and trapping. And this half of the buffer zone, it, it helped, but it didn't prevent East Fork, which was the primary family group, most historical, the most studied family group, going all the way back to Adolph Murray's landmark study of 1939-1941 from having the alpha female killed in the, in the eastern portion of the Wolf Townships. And that caused massive disruption with East Fork, very similar to what happened in Grant Creek in, in 2012. And then in 2010, well, the Board of Game, Park Service had put forward a more comprehensive proposal to protect all the wolf townships. It's the first time they'd ever done this. Uh, the Board of Game refused to consider it, and they actually uh, uh, opened up, you know, they took away the, the previous buffer zone and opened it up to hunting and trapping. And then, you know, the one thing I'd like to get across to folks is it, it doesn't take a lot of hunters or trappers to cause massive disruption within the family group. It only takes one knowledgeable trapper to do so. In fact, the trapper who killed the breeding female of East Fork in 2005 baited and killed the breeding female of Grant Creek in 2012. And he also killed in a previous generation, the East Fork alpha female in 1998. And so it only takes one tr knowledgeable trapper to create a tremendous amount of damage to wolf viewing in the park. Now, I think in I think Nikki had mentioned that there's maybe two active trappers in the townships, 
or at the least there could be a handful. So it's not necessarily a lot of trappers, but they can cause a massive amount of damage. And then after the 2005 incident, uh, the alpha female was killed in February. The alpha male uh, went back and forth um, from the den area to, to the area where she was trapped. He would eventually disperse south to Cantwell, where he was shot there. Uh, so this left six one- and two-year-olds left uh, in this family group. Again, all those various changes occurred afterwards, as far as changing territory, changing of hunting habits. Uh, very seldom did we see them afterwards uh, until East Fork, um, uh, until the breeding male in 2016 was shot at a bear bait station in the Wolf Townships. And that brought an end to Denali's, you know, from a generational standpoint, longest lived family group, most studied family group, the one that really had a lot of scientific, historical, and visitor viewing value, you know, certainly prior to 2005. That, that we had um so yeah it doesn't it, so it doesn't take a lot of hunters or trappers to cause this this massive amount of damage to not only the wolves themselves but but also to the visitor viewing of wolves so when we're talking about this and, and you say because i i think i'm sure we touched on this with uh with nicole and when we say nikki and nicole we mean the same person just so when he's listening is they're not we're talking about two different people but so baiting and all that stuff inside of this zone is perfectly legal. Is that accurate or is it, or is this just the way it is legal? Okay. So baiting is, yeah, to go through, go through some of the things. Cause it, I, cause I know, uh, again, Nicole went through this where inside Denali national park, there are a certain set of regulations and rules. And then in this zone that is governed, but is it, is it governed by the state? Is that the deal? It's governed by the state. So the state has different regulatory rules in terms of take and ways you can take predators in that zone. Correct? Absolutely. Okay. And, and in yeah. fact, uh, Alaska trapping laws are essentially a free for all. So meaning trapper can set his trap on November 1st or snare and not check it until roughly April 30th. There is no mandatory trap check times in Alaska. They are not required to warn the public of their trap lines, was putting signs up. They are not required to put ID or contact information on their traps or snares. Um, this is true. They can legally place them. And this would be like subdivisions like Healy, which is the nearest town. Uh, I was talking to a local in Healy last September, and he was talking, telling me that a trapper had placed his trap line in a subdivision. So they can legally place traps and snares in rural subdivisions, uh, near parking lots, near pullouts, near campgrounds, near be beach access areas. Last year, Nikki asked me to, to testify on behalf of dog owners uh, at the Board of Game meeting in Soldatna. Okay, one, I don't have a dog, but I agreed to do so. Um, on a proposals for Seward, Soldatna, and Homer to establish trapping setbacks for multiple use trails, hiking trails, and ski trails. This was done, these proposals were meant to specifically protect pet dogs, you know, so people could recreate with their dogs off leash while minimizing any chance of them being trapped or snared. Almost all of the, the proposals were shot down. The board of game refused to do it with the exception of a trail uh, across from Homer and Kachemak Bay State Park. And I think that a very limited setback of maybe 50 feet by right. campgrounds. <laughs> That's it. Oh, and oh, by the way, and in regards to that, so if you if your dog gets caught in a trap or snare, you know, you go through the trauma of releasing it, you are ob you are obligated by law to reset that trap or snare. What <laughs> makes no and, sense. And the trappers are not required to reimburse you for vet bills or for the death of your dog. So, I mean, essentially what Alaska trappers are telling all 730,000 Alaska residents is this. In a state that's two and a half times the size of Texas, there's no place outside of maybe Anchorage or Juneau where you can safely recreate with your dog, whether it's crossing 
skiing, snowshoeing, dog mushing, ski joring, ice fishing, winter camping, whatever, you know, safely let your dog off leash and recreate. That's essentially what they're telling state residents. Yeah. I, I know Nicole detailed this a little bit, obviously, that they that the board of game, uh, the board uh, board and game essentially is obviously skewed towards the uh, consumptive or the the hunter trapper on their on the board, which is why a lot of these things get shot down. Why do you think this is that? And I think we asked Nicole the same thing, but again, want to get your opinion. Where is the disconnect from the state state's point of view about the safety and security, not only of the wildlife that is there in the state of Alaska, but also its residents and its, you know, their domestic pets, their children, whatever it may be, because those are things that, you know, I, I know we hear a lot about when, you know, grizzlies are around or wolves are around that people worry about maybe their, their kids. And, you know, I, I think it's certain instances rightfully so, but in others it's like wolves are not going to come up and, and necessarily, you know, congregate around a large group of people. Why, why are there no steps taken for the safety of the residents and the domesticated animals that roam, like you say, the entire state of Alaska, and it's skewed so much towards the consumptive community and not giving the others a voice to have a say in this? You know, I think, you know, from the trapper's point of view, you know, if they give it like an inch... I think people are going to take a mile, yeah. take, go f- take it a mile. And then the other thing is, you know, trapping has been so romanticized up here, you, you know, you know, trying to portray tra- like, you know, as if they were in the 19th or 20th century, you know, and, and it's like, no, this, this is, this is what I'm referring to is recreational trapping. I'm not referring to subsistence trapping, you know, people who are, who are still living off the land. And I, I guess when I, when I talk about subsistence, I need to qualify this because there's two definitions for, of subsistence. The state recognizes all Alaskan residents have an equal right to subsistence, including urban, you know, Anchorage residents, for instance. Whereas the feds recognize a subsistence preference for rural and bush communities. So that's that's important because for rural and bush communities, you know, they don't have Costco's. They don't have a variety of restaurants to go to, a variety of grocery stores, things like that, whereas urban residents certainly do. So there's far fewer options for rural and bush communities. And so consequently, the state lost management of subsistence on federal lands, but they have it on their own state lands. So you kind of need to qualify that or make sure that people are aware that there's a difference in in what subsistence is when you talk, you know, when you're talking about it up here in Alaska. So when you're, when you're dealing with, because you deal with the non consumptive community, you know, in your, in your daily life, because you're obviously, you know, driving these transportation systems, you're, you know, tour guide, you're dealing with people who are not necessarily in the park to consume any of the animals that are there. They're there to view, they're there to photograph, whatever it may be. What are some of the things that you hear from those folks when they, when you give them basically the percentages of, well, the odds of us seeing wolves? And it, again, it's due to varying reasons, as you said before, but with, you know, the rock slide and, you know, COVID and people are finally coming back. So there, things are starting to, I guess, I would hope normalize at this point in 2024. But what are those reactions when these all these types, all this information is being relayed to them as they look to visit a park that, you know, again, wildlife is, is there for us to take in. And sometimes they do it. Obviously they do what they want. We're not going to see them all the time, but when your chances of that are slim to, you know, basically slim to none when you're looking for an apex predator, like a wolf. Well, it, it, it does vary. You know, certain years I'll get, you know, a lot of questions about wolves. Other years, like last year, I didn't get that many. And, you know, so, I mean, I talk, you know, I talked about Cura Steady, for instance, and I'll talk about wolves in general, but it doesn't usually go in the, you know, why aren't we seeing wolves very often unless people ask about it? You know, because one of the things you want to do on tour is you don't want to really like bum people out, especially from the get-go of the tour. I mean, 
if if the question's asked, you can't really avoid it. But you know, um, you know, I want to bring expectations down to a realistic level. I don't want them to be so sky high that they're expecting to see, you know, bears frolicking all on the tundra and playing with wolves and stuff like that. You know, but at the same time, you don't want to like start the tour out on a depressing note that yes the chances are bleak but there's still a chance no i don't think yeah i think it's just also i i think more of like what what i'm i guess i'm trying to get at is are are you seeing that uh, cuz i from what we gather from the call is that you know alaskans are very much um they're a community that is, you know, activated. They, they want to make sure that their places are, you know, wild and free and, and, you know, they're, they're, they're doing well. So if obviously there are people that are coming there to look for certain animals, I mean, people do this at Yellowstone all the time and I'm not comparing Denali to Yellowstone, two different situations, but, you know, are people seeing in the policy and the news and that, you know, wolves may be declining in certain areas because of X are, you know, is that going to impact my trip to Denali is really what I'm trying to get at. Are people correlating the two together or are they not even as involved as I would imagine? Yeah, I don't think, I don't think they are. You know, Denali, you know, Yellowstone has a core of wolf watchers and they have a whole wolf watching community there. And you also have small tours that are bringing people into Yellowstone specifically to look for wolves and of course other wildlife too and so you have businesses that are heavily invested uh, in in wolf viewing as well as visitors you know coming to Yellowstone from all over to to look for wolves we don't have that in Denali I mean we we kind of used to but you know, because wolves are, are, are so seldom seen now and experienced, and because businesses are not, the tourism industry in, in Alaska is not invested in protecting wildlife, whether wolves or anything else. I mean, you know, if someone decides that they don't want to take a crew, you know, take a cruise ship to Alaska, well, that's fine because there's always, you know, the, the businesses can always count on somebody else wanting to take their place. So they're not really answerable to to visitors coming to Alaska and they're not doing anything to support wildlife preservation or or the mandates of park service which is preservation and visitor enjoyment you know and and that's something I'd really like to see change I'd really like to see uh, uh, you know the businesses in Alaska model themselves in the business coalitions in Yellowstone because they are actively involved and they actively care uh, about what happens to Yellowstone wildlife and, and, you know, and I have heard the excuse, too, that, oh, we just don't want to get involved in the tourism industry. And my point of view is, if you're involved in the tourism industry, you are already involved. You have an obligation to support the preservation of wildlife because that's what people are traveling to Alaska to see and experience. It, it's it, it's one, one hand, one, you know, with one with the other, um, you know, to kind of abdicate that you know, to abdicate that responsibility, I feel is just absolutely irresponsible. Yeah. I was going to get to that too, because it seems as though the, again, the, there's disconnects in certain spots where, like you said, Yellowstone, there's, again, these businesses are, are driven by, you know, what's why you get millions and millions of viewers that are millions of visitors, I should say, not viewers, visitors to that park for specific, whether it's, you know, we want to see the bison herds or the bears or the prong or whatever it may be, the wolves, you know, that, that drives that industry. Is there a, like you said, so there is a lacking of Alaska is not yearning for that or, or the park. I'm sure the park is, is no one is championing the, the tourism aspect from, from what you can see to say, come to Alaska, see all these beautiful things, or they are, but just not, uh, it's, it's a surface level as opposed to really getting in into the nitty gritty of, Hey, we need to preserve as much as we possibly can because this is what people come to see. Yeah, yeah, I think there is a disconnect on that. You know, kind of a great example that that started last year is what we call the Mulchatna massacre, where the state, via helicopter, killed ninety four grizzly bears, including females and cubs, by helicopter, as well as five wolves and also five black bears. 
And there was no there was no outcry at all from the tourism industry. None. And the, state, and the state's planning to do that again this year as well. Um, well yeah, what's the rationale that? for that? What was what was the rationale for that? I can't remember. Okay, so the Mulchatna caribou herd uh, declined in numbers from 200,000 to 12,000. And they had been conducting wolf control, which was ineffective. But they found that the reason why the herd declined was one, due to climate change, habitat changes, because the, the food sources that caribou are dependent upon, especially in the wintertime, lichen and mosses, are very slow growing. They can take decades for them to recover. Well, if willows and dwarf birch are, you know, essentially crowding out whatever's left of the lichen and mosses, you, you know, habitat change is, you know, killing bears and wolves isn't gonna do anything if the habitat is changing. And then also there were disease factors, I think brucellosis and then also overhunting. They thought all those were the primary reasons why the herd declined in numbers. Well, because the wolf control program, which is wolf killing, was ineffective, well, they decided to throw bears in the mix, both grizzlies and black bears, even though they had not conducted any population studies of either one, even though they didn't do, conduct any studies beforehand to determine what level of predation bears were responsible for. And this was a decision made by the Alaska Board of Game. And so um, I know this is something that Alaska Wildlife Alliance uh, has been actively uh, working against uh, in, in regards to that. And so this is another example of wildlife mismanagement in Alaska, but also another example of how the tourism industry didn't, you know, there was no outcry from them. And yes, that may be a more remote area of the state, but it's like, you know, it's just, it's a terrible example. You know, you're having people come to Alaska to see wildlife and yet the state is literally conducting these massacres of wolves and bears in other locations or even outside Denali where they allow bear baiting. Um, again, in the Wolf Township. Yeah, I remember Nicole touching on that too. And yeah, I mean, yes, we, we dived into climate change and, and everything that's happening too, especially with ungulates. And it seems that they are the ones that are less adaptable, I would I would say to a degree. I mean, if we're talking about adaptability, I would think wolves are probably at the top. Bears are pretty good at adapting. You know, ungulates, you know, things sort of run rampant through herds. Uh, I don't, again, I'm not an expert, but just by seeing, you know, we talk about C CWD, chronic wasting disease. We talk about, you know, like you said, permafrost, it's melting on the tundra, it releases more diseases. And, you know, when you're a herding type animal, it's just going to proliferate or pro proliferate, I can't speak, um, you know, through the herd. And it's going to do that and you're not going to be able to fight off that stuff. And that's that's where a lot of that happens. Um, and we did discuss and you and you sent me, thank you for sending all the information you sent, Bill, about the proposals or and Nicole sent it too about the board of game proposals. And a lot of those proposals that we read through were just an increased amount of ways to either take predators out, whether it's by baiting, whether it's by night vision, whether it's by helicopter, whether it's by all these other different ways. And there was really only one proposal there about reestablishing the buffer zone. I think it was Prop 186. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, Bill. Yeah, that was just to, just to extend the buffer zone. And I believe, I don't know, I think that happened already. Um, I don't know if there was an outcome. Do you know if there was an outcome for those prop shit which ones what happened there so proposition 186 was rejected in a zero to seven vote by the alaska board of game so yeah denali's wolves are not protected in the wolf townships at all and then kind of as one of the other proposals in just outside the the southwestern quadrant of the park was a proposal to increase uh, the hunting of doll sheep even though doll sheep, the doll sheep population statewide has been declining due to uh, climate change, more icing during the winter, more heavy snowfall. And so while the doll sheep population is decreasing, they're proposing an increase in the hunting of doll sheep in these areas. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And, and also in that same area, they were proposing wolf control in that area as well. Um, so it, it is just, you know, this is not scientifically based wildlife management. You know, it's politically driven. 
you know, Safari Club, which we've, we've battled with on a number of occasions in regards to Alaska wildlife refuges and Alaska National Preserves, which Park Service governs as well. Um, you know, a lot of this is being driven by, by that. Certainly not all of it, but a lot of it. Are you guys dealing with, and, and again, if, again, I, I think Nicole touched on this, but again, I want your perspective as well. Are, is Alaska dealing with, like you said, uh, you already talked about Safari Club. Are, are we dealing with folks from out of state that want to come and take, you know, grab, you know, whatever the animal they want to grab in terms of hunting, like buying expensive tags? Is there land that's being allotted to privatize so that it's being sold and that people can block it off and you can come and hunt whenever you like? Or is Alaska dealing with those issues like some of the Western United States is where that, again, big plots of land are, are up for grabs and people want to, you know, create, you know, places that they can get a lot of money uh, for hunting an elk, for hunting, whatever it is. Are those some of the issues that are starting to creep into Alaska too, or are they already there? Yeah. I'm not aware of any canned hunts, you know, where you have like a ranch and the canned hunt takes place on that ranch. I'm not aware of any of that going on in Alaska. So these, where this is taking place is either on federal or state land. And, you know, of course you depend on the federal lands, it, it can either, and I'll just use Denali as an example, the preserve and new additions, which makes up about 4 million of Denali 6.2 million acres. Now under ANILCA, which is the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, and that's, it's a real mouthful. That's why we use the acronym of ANILCA. Well, under ANILCA, um, hunting and trapping is allowed. So subsistence hunting by federal definition is allowed in the preserve and new additions. Limited sport hunting is also allowed, but it cannot endanger the wildlife populations or interfere with the natural, um, the natural flow of predator-prey relations. You, in other words, it, it cannot be a manipulated population. You can't favor predators by killing them to try to boost moose and caribou populations. And that's something the state tried to push through and in, in fact, in, in 2020, um, abhorrent hunting practices were allowed into the Alaska National Preserves, not only in Denali, but all of them. This would be the shooting of black bears, flashlighting and shooting black bears in the dens, shooting black bears and cubs, baiting and killing grizzlies, uh, shooting uh, swimming caribou from motorboats, uh, also using dogs uh, to hunt bears. All of that was allowed in the, under, in, under the 2020 rules. AWA and other conservation groups through Trustees for Alaska filed suit. Uh, they won their suit against Park Service and Park Service was supposed to be rewriting those rules. And in the public comment period, because I responded to this in both 2020, which was like a 36 monstrosity, I was so pissed off at, at what those rules were. But in, in in the recent comment period that was leading up to the rewrite, the one thing that, you know, Park Service was making a lot of changes, changes which were very positive, but there are two areas where they didn't address. One was the bag limit for wolves by trappers. It's unlimited. And two is the hunting season for hunters, meaning on August 1st or August 10th, depending on which game management unit intersects with the preserved new additions, wolves could be hunted which means that wolf pups, which are in the rendezvous sites and are highly dependent on the adults at that time, could also be hunted or killed. Wolf pelts at that time are worthless. And this is something that had been on the books, you know, for years, I mean, well beyond 2020. This is something Gordon, Dr. Gordon Haber tried to have changed, I think in 2008 or nine, 2008 or seven or, or so, and he was just shot down. Um, but depending on what those changes are, those are going to be the things I'm going to be looking for in if there's a new public comment period to see if those bag limits are changed and to see if the, the seasons are changed. Oh, and the hunters could take 10 wolves per hunter. Now, one thing that you'll hear is that, oh, it's a remote area. You know, not very many wolves are taken in that area. You know, that doesn't matter. These areas preserve new additions, which are governed by Park Service 
should not have any type of de facto wolf control allowed in them, whether it's utilized or whether it's not. That is de facto wolf control. And so that's something I would be looking very closely at, uh, depending on what that rewrite of Park Service's rules are for the preserve and new additions. Um, and the other thing, the one unknown about that is in regards to Anelka, I don't know how much flexibility Park Service has to reduce those bag limits or change the seasons. That would be a question for Park Service. But I'd certainly like to see minimal bag limits and you know, a shortening of the season, and certainly not when wolf pups are dependent on, on the adults. And, and, and also when, it, that just doesn't make any sense at all. That's- No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't make any, it doesn't make any rational sense in that regard. When is the next comment? So when it, when are these rules up? So uh, is this the same public comment? So anybody from around the, the United States can, can make comment on this? When, do you know when the next public comment period is and, and when those rewrites are supposed to be made or you don't know? Okay, so to my knowledge, I have not heard of, uh, of, of the Park Service completing the rewrite. So when the rewrite is finalized, you know, that's when there should be another public comment which would allow people to, to write in. And, you know, so they may change all those various other abhorrent hunting activities, which I'd mentioned. That, those were the things that Safari Club was pushing. But, you know, they may, like, ignore the bag limits, the seasons for wolves. And that's something I would stress to everyone. Be on the lookout for that. You know, don't let that slide by. Because um, that, that really needs to change. What's the, what's the best way? Because I know you... Um, we're going to be talking with uh, the filmmaker for A Good Wolf. Did you have any involvement in that film I saw on your, I think on your bio, on your photography page, you were, I saw you had a photo of you, they interviewed you for that. What what was that experience like and how is that? Because I know you, and we'll get to your photography in, in a moment as we wrap so that you, because this is how you really get your your messages out and your, you know, your photography is wonderful. But what was it like working on that film, A Good Wolf, and being a part of that type of a, a, a film uh, with a piece of uh, with a piece of land and, and an animal that seems that you're so uh, fired up and passionate about to make sure that everything is right. Yeah, no, the, the interview went really well. It, there were some start and stops with it, but it lasted for about an hour and a half, uh, and we covered a lot of ground during that time frame, uh, incurring touching on you know, the tourism industry as well. Um, now, I have no idea how much of that interview Ramey will use. You know, it might just be a little bit part. Maybe it'll be more. You know, that was completely left up to her, um, you know, and how to integrate that. Uh, or, or, you know, maybe she won't use you know, or maybe use very little of it. But, you know, that part was completely up to her. But, you know, she and I did talk at that time where, you know, she was getting... Um, a lot of people on the environmental side not willing to be a part of this. And I thought that was a real mistake on the environmental side. And the reason they didn't is because they didn't want to be a part of something where, you know, the point of view of hunters and trappers was being, was being um, discussed. And, and, you know, because they are interviewing, you know, she was interviewing hunters and trappers as well to get their perspective. Uh, my point of view on that is, you know, the more we can contrast our position with hunters and trappers, you know, we not only are there for, for wolves, but also the visitor experience, also for the park experience itself, you know, to the public. Yeah, you know, I think the public will be able to see and make the decision for themselves. And, and I think that's really where it has to come from. You know, you can present the information to the public and then trust in them, ideally, to make a decision that that benefits them you know i mean if they don't want to see wolves if, if you know if the public doesn't want to see wolves well this is how you go about not seeing wolves and how you undermine and subvert the protections of a national park um yeah no there's there's a lot and there's a lot to do that a lot to do obviously here in, in order to, to 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 make some change here around the state and and to do like you said, what's right by the non-consumptive community that we've we've come to know, and 
make sure that there, there is an even handed approach uh, from both sides and to find compromise because otherwise if we don't have compromise. We're just, we're just, you know, hitting our heads against the wall and not really making a whole lot of progress, unfortunately. Well, with that. actually in regards to the compromise, I just want to make this point too, because this, there was a graph put out and that's in, uh, Nikki can point you out to it. Um, the graph shows the state of Alaska and it shows how many areas where wolves are completely protected. And it's only like 2.6% of Alaska where wolves are completely protected. That's in Denali, the core, the core wilderness areas of Denali, Katmai, and Glacier Bay. That's it. So if we're talking compromise, and if we're talking balance, meaning 50-50, well, we're a long ways from a balance of 50-50. So, you know, that little sliver of land of the Wolf Townships, that's not going to get us anywhere near a, a balanced solution. But as far as its impacts to the park itself, having the wolves pre protected there, yes, that would be a tremendous benefit to, to the wolves and also wolf viewing and Denali. Absolutely. What's the... So just tell everybody what's the best way, Bill, to, uh, I guess, be, you know, an advocate and to look because you have a, you have a great website, um, you know, tell people where to go to that, to, to see your photos. I, I know it's all about um, education, information, advocacy, making sure that people are aware of the information. What are some places you can tell them to go that if this strikes a nerve or strikes a chord and they want to be involved, what's, what's the best place for them to be? Yeah. You know, I would really recommend uh, for folks to go to the Alaska wilderness, the wildlife alliances uh, website, also the Denali citizens council, uh, also known as DCC. Uh, they handle, they cover also a lot of the local issues that Denali is dealing with, not just with wolves, but other topics too, especially the pretty rock situation as it's, uh, as it's ongoing as well. Uh, those would certainly be two of them. Uh, Trustees for Alaska, which they have their own website. Um, a lot, you know, these are the, the lawyers that have been representing the environmental community. So touching base with their website and, and their um, newsletter, which they send out periodically, that's definitely worthwhile to, uh, to keep tabs on as well. So there are a number of resources uh, that are out there for folks to check out. Um, you know, and kind of keep in mind that, you know, for the local Alaska environmental community, it, you know, when you compare us to like the NRA and Safari Club, we're way under, underfunded. You know, so, um, you know, so, you know, I think any help going to AWA or DCC, you know, would be awesome. Or, or certainly the other groups, too, that are in Alaska. But, yeah, we're way underfunded compared to, to like, Safari Club and, and uh, the NRA. Yeah, we're going to have all those links in the in the description for this episode. So anybody who's listening, if you, it'll be just a simple click away to go to some of these places and, Again, make your comments, make your voices heard. And if this is something that strikes a chord or a nerve, boy, just just do it. Uh, Bill, my last question for you is when you hear the word wolf, what is the thing that comes to your mind? Freedom. Yeah. 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 Without question. Yeah. No, it, it sounds, and that's what you've been advocating for. I, I think the whole time we've been talking is just to have them be free and do what they got to do and, like you said, just to have Denali as a whole, it's very weird to see a, a park and then there's like this slot that's just sort of like taken out. It's it's crazy to see that. But Bill Watkins, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing, all of the, you know, administrative, the photography, the, just the information uh, is always helpful for anybody that doesn't know what's happening. So again, really appreciate meeting you and talking with you and uh, best of luck. Uh, and we will do anything we can to help you guys up there in Alaska to make sure that wolves are uh, are safe and have a fair shot yeah thank you thank you for this opportunity yeah really appreciate you just hang tight while we sign off uh how's to all of you out there and we'll talk to you next time bye everybody looking for more information about wolf connection or the podcast please visit our website at wolfconnection.org where you can donate sponsor a wolf or become a volunteer